A lot of people are talking about cultural Marxism. A cultural Marxist is either someone who intentionally creates divisions in society in order to bring about the revolutionary predictions of Karl Marx, or someone who unwittingly subscribes to social justice activism without realizing its alleged Marxist underpinnings. Cultural Marxism was introduced to Americans by a man named William S. Lind. But the concept goes back much further. The association of culture and communism was first pointed out by Dadaist painter Richard Huelsenbeck when he declared in 1920 that Dada, the movement in art and painting, was Bolshevik. When Huelsenbeck said this, he was identifying himself as a Bolshevik, but later this association would be used to paint modern artists as enemies of the state. The term in German came to be Kultur Bolshevismus. Kultur Bolshevismus, or cultural Bolshevism, was used by the Nazis to denounce modernist movements in art as Bolshevik, degenerate, and somehow all connected to a Jewish plot for world domination. In 1937, the Nazi party put on an art exhibit of so-called degenerate art. It coincided with another exhibit that the Nazis deemed great German art. The point of this was to deride modernist movements such as Cubism, Fauvism, Dada, and Surrealism, and to associate the art with a larger Jewish and Bolshevik conspiracy to undermine German society. Thus, cultural Bolshevism fits within the larger context of Judeo-Bolshevism. Judeo-Bolshevism being the association of Jews with communism which existed in the popular imaginations of 20th century Europeans and Americans, which led to the rise of fascism and the final solution. Perhaps the person to bring this idea of cultural Bolshevism to the rest of the world was Italy's Julius Evola. He too was a Dadaist painter who declared the movement Bolshevismo Culturale. Evola was a complex figure, if ever there was one. He wrote about racism and anti-Semitism from a right-wing perspective, but in a way that the fascists of his day did not perfectly agree with. While he sympathized with some aspects of fascism and national socialism, he never was a member of a fascist party and was distrusted by them. His philosophical writings were largely based on the supernatural, mystical, and pseudoscientific. He is more accurately described as a traditionalist and elitist, advocating for a strict social hierarchy. When he declared that the Dadaist movement was Bolshevik, unlike Welsenbeck, he was distancing himself from a movement which he had grown to dislike, and transitioning from painter to a writer of philosophy. What we may call a culture of decomposition is above all a social tendency consisting of a tendentious approach displaying ideals as illusory, values as pure convention, while deeming institutions as unjust and defective. An attitude emphasizing higher right of life, instinct, the irrational, the purely human, and thus it creates a new superstition constituted by the subconscious, the unconscious, the libido, and an all-encompassing eros as the true roots of all existence and human exclusivity. Such notions may be measured by their direct and indirect effects. They are ferments of ethical and spiritual decomposition, and their ultimate consequence can only be Marxism. Cultural Marxism manifests itself in literature, art, philosophy, and science in a general culture which appears to lack any relation whatsoever with Marxist thinking and communist political propaganda, even if its creators or promoters assume they are not exercising any political influence, their actions will inexorably result in a destructive Marxism. Here we have at least two Dadaist painters who saw a Bolshevist plot in their movement. Furthermore, you will find many modern abstract artists conforming to some form of leftism or communism, yet many others were apolitical, and some do appear to have arguably right-wing views. The politically conservative painter was most likely holding to a traditionalist style, while the modernist movements around them were in a constant state of flux. So does that mean modern art is Marxist? How does line and color represent a political philosophy? By itself, it doesn't, Ebola says. 
but it represents a departure from the traditional, and therefore its very acceptance by members of a society is a rejection of hierarchy that can only lead to Marxism. In 1931, journalist Karl von Ossietzky mocked the flexibility with which the term cultural Bolshevism had begun to be used. Cultural Bolshevism is when conductor Klemperer takes Tempe, different from his colleague Furtwangler, when a painter sweeps a color into his sunset not seen in Lower Pomerania, when one favors birth control, when one builds a house with a flat roof, when a cesarean birth is shown on the screen, when one admires the performance of Chaplin and the mathematical wizardry of Einstein. This is called cultural Bolshevism and a personal favor rendered to Herr Stalin. Now through the accusation of cultural Bolshevism, anything that was not directly commissioned by the state could be rejected and the art of a nation carefully controlled. And therein lies the danger. Cultural Bolshevism is indelibly linked with Nazis and the Italian fascists. It is concerning that a relic of such a widely criticized and condemned political philosophy is being touted today as truth by people who don't seem to recognize its history as much as it is by those who proudly associate themselves with that history. In the 1990s, William S. Lind brought the same concept to Americans and dubbed it cultural Marxism. According to the Lindian variant of cultural Marxism, a group known as the Frankfurt School secretly controls academics and broader society by infusing Marxism into all levels of academics, corporations, and government but also by changing Marxism's class struggle to the oppression espoused in identity politics, political correctness, and secularism. Now, seemingly anything anti-Christian, untraditional, or opposed to the conservative idea of Western culture can be blamed on this Marxist plot. The Frankfurt School was an academic group that practiced critical theory from the 1920s through to today. They sought to apply the sciences to politics in the way Karl Marx had 100 years before in order to create academic solutions to the world's problems. They believed that societal structures and cultural assumptions were the causes of inequality. All of them were Marxists and were predominantly German Jews. This led to them being exiled from Germany by the Nazi party for the belief that they were part of a larger Jewish communist plot for world domination. The fact that leaders of the Frankfurt School were Jewish is not insignificant, and their ulterior motive fits neatly into Nazi and far-right propaganda associating Jews with communism. This exodus from Germany is especially prescient to Americans because in exile they became part of New York's Columbia University. After witnessing the Holocaust, members of the Frankfurt School replaced their revolutionary zeal with pessimism and defeatism. They wrote about reasons why the revolution predicted by Marx had not come to the West and why it might never. Critical theory is still used today in women's studies and other leftist realms at universities, but it is not the only philosophical framework under which these studies are carried out. The suspicion of the Frankfurt School is shared by today's alt-right and yesterday's Nazi Germany. To both, the school is a stronghold of Germany's and all of Western civilization's enemies, either due to their Marxist publications or the Jewish staff that wrote them. For the first time, Americans today are not free to say what they think. If they say something deemed offensive or insensitive or, worst of all, hate speech, they may be in serious trouble. The Frankfurt School formally opened its doors on June 22, 1924, but it had already held its first seminar on theory in the spring of 1923. There, almost two dozen Marxist scholars gathered for what Weil, the sponsor, called a Marxist study week. One of the participants was Richard Sorge, later a famous Soviet spy. Another was Georg Lukacs. Lukács' writings on culture were the basis for much of the program. Almost half of the participants in this Marxist study week would later be affiliated with the Frankfurt School. Following Lukács' lead, the Frankfurt School would be the vehicle that translated Marxism from economic into cultural terms, giving us what we now know as political correctness. If that sounds like a leap in logic, that's because it is. 
The term politically correct started in the 70s and 80s, and it arose from the fact that there were several groups of people who were being called by names that they found offensive. As a result, words like gypsy and Indian fell out of favor because the terms Roma and Native American were preferred by members of those groups. Some words like intellectually disabled and handicapped replaced retarded or crippled and was largely spearheaded by the medical community and again the members of those groups who didn't want to be called by certain names. It is about using language that isn't offensive to people and that the right often pushes back claiming it infringes on their free speech. To the conservatives, it's deemed offensive to say anything that undermines the constitution, religion, or the military, so they have their own form of political correctness, which they have successfully organized to censor many things throughout the 80s and 90s. This has nothing to do with anything Marx or the Frankfurt School put out. Cultural Marxism and Judeo-Bolshevism serve one and the same purpose, that is to oversimplify the world. They invent an enemy that is responsible for divisions in society and cultural degradation. I will argue that the need to invent these conspiracy theories arises from a need to avoid engaging leftist theories on their merits. That is that the left is right in saying that the aristocracy and the capitalist class has undeserved wealth, and the way they achieve that wealth creates poverty. In Judeo-Bolshevism, equality is a trick to give power to the Jews. In cultural Marxism, it is a trick by Marxists to gain power. Let's get one thing straight. The association of Jews with communism is a false correlation. Some Jews were communists, but so were some Catholics. There is no correlation. But the reasons why Jewish communism existed in the popular imaginations of Europeans is a difficult question that historians have struggled with. For one, Jews had been associated with disorder, subversion, and revolution in medieval Christian superstitions. For many, the Bolshevik Revolution was seen as the fulfillment of a prophecy that Jews would attempt to enslave Christian Europe. This prophecy was outlined in popular writing, for example, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Some Jews were Bolshevik, and their caricatures were used in nationalist propaganda. Bolsheviks that weren't Jewish were often labeled as such anyways, preventing people from realizing the lack of correlation. In the Polish-Soviet War in 1919, tens of thousands of refugees fled Galicia, a region that is now part of Poland and Ukraine, to Vienna and Budapest to escape anti-Jewish violence. Their social tensions between Gentiles and Eastern Jews increased. The right-wing press and opportunistic politicians blamed them for food and housing shortages. A young Hitler saw this influx of foreign refugees while living in Vienna, and the nationalist press there fueled his xenophobia and anti-Semitism. I now often turn to the Volksblatt, which was much smaller in size, but which treated such subjects more decently. I was not in accord with its sharp anti-Semitic tone, but again and again, I found that its arguments gave me grounds for serious thought. But ultimately, race was destined to be tied with communism by the right. Communist leaders sold their ideology as a great alliance of working class and peasants who rose up and seized the factories and fields from the landowners and capitalists, bringing the output of the whole economy into the hands of the common man. They preached unity and racial equality and denounced religion. It was far too tempting for the poor to view this transformation as beneficial. To the Nazis and the far right, they did not accept communism as a liberation of the working class. Rather, this was a great trick. The inferior minds of the Eastern races allowed themselves to become slaves the slave master was the Jew, and the Germans, who were threatened by the new revolution, must protect their race from subjugation. When William S. Lind popularized cultural Marxism in the United States, he carefully removed the anti-Semitic rhetoric that it historically came with. Rather than seeing Jews as the threat to white civilization, he focused on the new threat of Islamization. 
and it's going to be just like the Thirty Years' War in Europe, and that is to our advantage. Because if you look at the demographics of this region, you see that it is filled with young men with no prospects, no jobs, and nothing to do. Well, what do young men do under those circumstances? They fight. This is supply-side war. You are going to have wars where you have those demographics. What we want to ensure is that we are isolated from the disorder that causes. We can't stop it. We benefit from it. And the single most po important policy action we need to take is make sure we admit not one single refugee that will be fleeing by the million from these conflicts. Because if they come here or to Europe, they will bring the same conflicts with them wherever they go. Now, cultural Marxism is a blanket term that includes anything from moral relativism to postmodernism to toleration of foreign religions such as Islam. The right wing has always been obsessed with preserving Western civilization from imagined enemies. In order to indoctrinate the masses into accepting society for the way it is, oppression or not, a good propagandist must have an enemy. The Jews who fled the violence of Eastern Europe in World War I are now the Muslims fleeing the violence in Iraq and Syria. This continent no longer confronts the specter of communism. We are confronted by another oppressive ideology, one that seeks to export terrorism and extremism all around the globe. The fundamental question of our time is whether the West has the will to survive. Do we have the confidence in our values to defend them at any cost? Do we have enough respect for our citizens to protect our borders? Do we have the desire and the courage to preserve our civilization in the face of those who would subvert and destroy it? This Islamophobia is the anti-Semitism of modern-day fascism. You know, the, the right wing is really hard on the Frankfurt School, you know, on the Frankfurt School where these kind of neo-Marxist guys who combined Marxism with Freudianism in the 1940s and, and they were avowed neo-Marxists, you know, so it's not like I'm making an accusation. And they were kind of anti-system type people and, and all of that. But I think to lay what's happening at the universities and in, broad, at, in the broader culture itself at the feet of the Frankfurt School is insufficient. Conservative thinker and polemicist Jordan Peterson has a variation on cultural Marxism that he has termed postmodern neo-Marxism. And then what happened was the postmodernists came onto the scene and they were all Marxists. But they couldn't be Marxists anymore because you couldn't be a Marxist and claim that you were a human being by the end of the 1960s. And so they started to play a sleight of hand and instead of pitting the proletariat, the working class, against the bourgeoisie, they started to pit the oppressor, the oppressed against the oppressor. And that opened up the avenue to identifying any number of groups as oppressed and oppressor and to continue the same narrative under a different name. It was no longer specifically about economics. It was about power. He seeks to draw a connection between postmodernism and Marx. This connection is just as tenuous as the Nazi vision connecting modernism and Bolshevism. Postmodernism is a broad criticism of ideology and objectivity that arose in response to modernism. In my view, these developments starkly contrast with Marxism's ideological foundation and Hegelian origin. Karl Marx is an example of someone who believed in objective reality, who had his roots in materialism, the philosophy that all things can be traced back to physical interactions. He adopted Hegel's methods of logical reasoning, which were called dialectics, Moral relativism, the idea that there are no objective or absolute moral values, which some say arises from postmodernist discourse, but in reality may be as old as philosophy itself, did not apply to Marx. He was long dead when Derrida and Foucault came on the scene. But Jordan Peterson believes postmodernism was an extension of Marxism, 
claiming that it sought to continue the same dynamic of oppressor versus oppressed. And so since the 1970s, under the guise of postmodernism, we've seen the rapid expansion of identity politics throughout the universities. It's, came, it's come to dominate all of the humanities, which are, which are dead as far as I can tell, and a huge proportion of the social scientists, sciences. And we've been publicly funding extremely radical postmodern leftist thinkers who are hell-bent on demolishing the fundamental substructure of Western civilization. And that's no, that's no paranoid delusion. That's, that's, that's their self-admitted goal. And I've identified, not only me, obviously, but one of the main players in this entire drama is a French philosopher named Jacques Derrida, who was, who I think most trenchantly formulated the anti-Western philosophy that is being pursued so assiduously by the radical left. And I think its dangers cannot be, I don't think its dangers can be overstated. And I also don't think the degree to which it's already infiltrated our culture can be overstated. The principal connection between Marxism and postmodernism is that both are undermining philosophies. That is, they attack existing power structures. They are both left-wing. Furthermore, Peterson suggests the rise of women's studies is part of a plot to disguise Marxism as something else. Maybe Peterson is right that there are now too many gender ethnic studies programs in colleges and not enough conservatives and classical liberals defending their ideas. However, I question why there needs to be a deceit or a sleight of hand involved. This was simply the result of many years of activism and volunteering, and even today these programs struggle to get funding from their universities. The suggestion that these groups are hiding their true intentions is nothing more than an ad hominem meant to demonize the left rather than engage the arguments on their merit. I would argue that attacking existing power structures is an essential feature of the left. In the words of Robert McIver, the conservative right has defended entrenched prerogatives, privileges, and powers. The left has attacked them. The right has been more favorable to the aristocratic position, to the hierarchy of birth or of wealth. The left has fought for the equalization of advantage or of opportunity for the claims of the less advantaged. If Marx and Derrida and women's studies are connected by anything, it is just that they constitute different elements of the left, which is in reality a much more deeply fractured part of the political spectrum than the right. Hitler was one of the greatest storytellers of the 20th century. In the 1920s, uh, many Germans experienced their situation as a confused mess. They didn't understand what is happening to them with military defeat, economic crisis, what they perceived as moral decay, and so on. Hitler provided a story, a plot, which was precisely that of a Jewish plot. We are in this mess because of the Jews. In a similar way, the alt-right obsession with cultural Marxism expresses the rejection to confront the fact that the phenomena they criticize as the effect of the cultural Marxist plot, moral degradation, sexual promiscuity, consumerist hedonism, and so on, are the outcome of the immanent dynamic of capitalist societies. The turn towards culture as a key component of capitalist reproduction and concomitant to it, the commodification of cultural life itself, are, I think, crucial moments of capitalist expanded reproduction. So the term cultural Marxism, I think, plays the same role as that of the Jewish plot in anti-Semitism. It projects or transposes some immanent antagonism, however you call it, ambiguity, tension of our socio-economic life onto an external cause in exactly the same way. In his debate with Jordan Peterson, Slazhov Zizek suggested that cultural Marxism plays the same role that Judeo-Bolshevism played in the 20th century. It creates a threat to Western civilization that is mostly imagined, and the cultural collapse we are witnessing 
is actually caused by the consumerist hedonism wrought by capitalism, not any critical theorists of the Frankfurt School, nor is it brought about by postmodernist essays. Even the French intellectuals like Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre, the famous philosopher, had to admit by the end of the 1960s that the, the, the Stalinist, Communist, Maoist experiment and all of its variants, not just those particular dictators, but all of its variants, was an absolute catastrophic failure. Peterson says the Marxist experiment in Russia and China made it difficult for any intellectual to continue as a Marxist. Despite the failures of China's Great Leap Forward and Stalin's mass collectivization, Peterson's assertion does not appear to be true. In fact, through the 60s and 70s, communism saw a resurgence in popularity, especially in France and Italy, where the communist parties were the third and second largest, respectively. Peterson specifically mentions Jean-Paul Sartre, who changed his mind about the USSR after the Soviet invasion of Hungary in 1956. What he fails to remember is that Sartre became critical of the Soviet Union, not because he had come to reject Marxism, but because he was an unwavering Stalinist, critical of Khrushchev's reform. Probably the most enormous mistake was the report of Khrushchev. Because of the public solemn denunciation, the detailed exposure of all the crimes of a sacred figure who represented the regime for so long is madness when such frankness is not made possible by a prior and considerable rise in the standard of living of the population. The result was to reveal the truth to masses who are not ready to hear it. Here, Jean-Paul Sartre is referring to Khrushchev's famous secret speech, which condemned the former regime of Joseph Stalin. However, despite the famines and the murders and the gulags, Stalin also brought Russia and the USSR into the modern industrial age, raising life expectancy and the standard of living, which made him revered by many people. So Sartre seems to think that the secret speech was a mistake. In fact, Sartre continued writing in defense of Marxist theory and neutrally about Stalin's reign until his death. For Hegel, as we have seen, the apodicticity of dialectical knowledge implied the identity of being, action, and knowledge. Marx began by positing that material existence was irreducible to knowledge, that praxis outstrips knowledge in its real efficacy. Needless to say, this is my own position, Jean-Paul Sartre. Marxists did not disguise themselves as postmodernists. In fact, there was no shortage of self-avowed Marxist intellectuals in the 1960s and 70s. Those labeled postmodernists, like Michael Foucault, were often at odds with them, disagreeing with core Marxist tenets. Marxism exists in 19th century thought like a fish in water. That is, it is unable to breathe anywhere else. Michael Foucault, The Order of Things. What the postmodernists did do was examine state-controlled systems that used ideology and propaganda for social control. When they examined Western society under the same vein, conservative intellectuals recoiled at the notion that our press, education, and political parties were controlled by a state ideology, just as they were in Soviet Russia or Nazi Germany. Now listen, you the right of the Stop calling me a crypto let's, let's stop or calling I'll names you and let's in your get goddamn face, and you'll stay plastered. Gentlemen, let's oh, Bill, let let's the author of Myra Bracken, Breckenridge I, go back to his pornography and stop making any allusions of Nazi. I beg somebody you to. In this debate between Gore Vidal and William Buckley, you can see Buckley losing his temper and threatening to physically attack Vidal because he likened American news suggesting we had a noble cause to invade Vietnam to the propaganda of the Nazis and he labeled Buckley as one such propagandist. You must realize what some of the political issues are here, that many so people in the United States uh, happen to believe that the United States policy is wrong in Vietnam, and the Viet Cong are correct in wanting to organize their country in their own way politically. This happens to be pretty much the opinion of Western Europe and many other parts of the world. If it is a novelty in Chicago, that is too bad. But I assume that the point of the American democracy yeah. and is you can express any point of view you want. 
Shut up a minute. No, I won't. And some people were pro Nazi, no. and the answer is that they were they were well treated by people who ostracized them. And I'm for ostracizing people who egg on other people to shoot American Marines and American soldiers. As I know you don't as care. As far as I'm concerned, any sense the only sort of pro or crypto Nazi yeah. I can think of is yourself. Uh, Failing that. Let's, I would only let's say that we negative. can't have now listen, you the right of the assembly Stop calling here. me a crypto Nazi. Let's, let's Jacques Derrida was outwardly critical of Marx, but at the same time he was perhaps even more critical of Western liberal democracy. On the rise of liberal democracy in Europe, after the fall of the Soviet Union, he remarked, Never before in absolute figures have so many men, women, and children been subjugated, starved, or exterminated on the earth. The right forms conspiracies, like cultural Marxism, when they are unable or unwilling to attack the left on its own merits. The right sees the world in terms of winners and losers, and naturally wants to be on the winning side of history. When the left stands up for populations around the world who are under attack by current power structures, conservatives can't help but see it as a kind of betrayal and a siding with the enemy. History isn't a series of winners and losers, but the struggle of human beings against limited resources. The enemy is nature. Probably most people believe in some progress. They are not completely right or left, but fall somewhere in between. I think it's important not to be a total nihilist. It's important to find some things that you agree with and some things to be grateful about in your society, culture, and government. And when George Lukacs of the Frankfurt School lamented in 1919, who will save us from Western civilization, I do not think he was in favor of destroying everything the West has built. He was merely pointing out that after the fall of the monarchy and the noble families like the Hohenzollerns and the Habsburgs, that Western people will still want to be ruled in the old way because it's their culture. In Marxism, this is the concept of class consciousness, the idea that poor people are happy to be poor as long as nobody points out that they are being used and oppressed. The fascist movement of the 20th century reacted to the communists by telling people that class isn't real, that the revolution was meant to subvert those who rightfully held power and give it to new Jewish masters. This is what the right is beginning to do through the concept of cultural Marxism. But the new ethno-religious enemy is the Middle Easterners against Judeo-Christian Western civilization. And the modernists have been replaced with the new trendy movements on the left, which are actually secretly Marxist revolutionaries. So is cultural Marxism a real thing? It kind of depends on how you define cultural Marxism. Is there a conspiracy by the left to overthrow Western civilization, replace it with a new Marxist communist regime. It's not much of a conspiracy because society has accepted liberal democracy as the predominant method of doing things. Marxists are completely marginalized and the idea that they are working in secret to control what the governments of liberal democracies around the world are doing is not something I personally believe. Universities exist under a capitalist, liberal democratic system, and their main motivation is to make money. Even nonprofit schools are very concerned with attracting students. Because of a multitude of factors, the cost of going to school has become extremely inflated and academics have clearly suffered because of that. Grade inflation is more rampant and a degree means less to employers than it once did. And this is especially the case in the U.S. I mean, one of the things that's happened over the last 30 years is that the, the proportion of university expenditures that's gone to the administration has, has massively, massively increased. And at the same time, the student loan burden has increased. And so what's happened in a weird sense is that the administrators have conspired to steal the future earnings of their students.
and then mm. you can't declare bankruptcy. So to me, it's indentured servitude. Well, you can't declare bankruptcy on student loans. Right, that's you a can't very declare. That's distinction. right. You cannot declare bankruptcy on student loans. So you think about that. You tell me what difference there is between that and indentured servitude. There's not much because it's the only thing that I can even think of where and that's the case. Corporations can go bankrupt. Right. They and do it all the time. Individuals can. Individuals right. can. Businesses can fail. The Frankfurt School and critical theory had crept into American academia long before these changes, and their work is only celebrated for the merits of its contributions to political science. And at the same time, it's marginalized and ignored by actual governments of the world who have embraced capitalism for better or for worse. Thank you for watching. Like and subscribe, leave a comment, or ring the bell. And as always, have a great day.